your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, if you would tonight. We're not halfway through with this series yet, but we've already accomplished some things. We have eliminated what the church is not. The church is not a building. It is not a denomination. The church is not invisible. And it's not possible that the church is universal. We have qualified some things, what the church is. The church is a local, called out, assembly of born-again, baptized believers united together by a common faith and fellowship in the gospel for the purpose of glorifying God through obedience to His Word. We've learned that Jesus Christ built His church and He did so during His earthly ministry before His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to heaven. And last week we shared the promise of the continuation of the Lord's church from the time He built it until He comes back in the clouds to get His people. So there's a lot of news about the church that we've shared, but we can still go into detail a little more. We can consider the nature of the church. And as we talk about the nature of the church, it's just from a different angle, a a very personal understanding of the Lord's church. You know, there are certain words in the Bible that are used to describe the nature of the church. And many of those words, they are not literal, they are figurative, but they give us such a clear understanding of what we're talking about as it describes many things. There are many figurative words used in the Bible to describe a lot of things. You think about Jesus when He called the Pharisees serpents and vipers. He wasn't literally saying that they are a snake slithering on the ground, but he's speaking of their depraved nature, their character, their deceptiveness, and the fact that they are in an unsaved condition. You think about how Jesus calls us branches in John chapter 15. Now, he's not literally saying that we are a branch stemming off of a vine, but that's figurative, and it gives us such a great clarity to consider the fact that the ability that we have, it comes from Him. He is the source. He is our power. Actually, right there in John 15, He says, Without me, ye can do nothing. And so all of that gives us such a great understanding by the fact of Him saying that He is the vine and we are the branches. And there are numerous occasions in God's Word where we can consider figurative speech throughout the Bible. It's very helpful to us. It casts a different light on what is being said. And we can see things from another angle and we can understand it. And the Bible does the same thing with the church. We have some figurative words for the church that we might understand it just that much more. And... We have the word here where you've turned tonight, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. We have the word body. The church is likened unto a body. And it says, speaking of the Lord, "...and hath put all things under His feet, and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body." The fullness of Him that filleth all in all. The way that this word speaks would be to the church in the way of one another. The way we have relationship to one another. We're likened unto a body here. In 1 Corinthians 
chapter 12 and verse 12. I'll, I'll read something else on that. It says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And I'm going to read a little more, 25 through 27 of 1 Corinthians 12. It says that there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. We're, we're a body and that's the idea of unity. It's the idea of togetherness. I think about our study in the book of Ephesians. Maybe, maybe it's been a year ago now. And I, I believe I recall about three messages in a row as we went through the book on unity and the importance of unity in the body of Christ. And we see that here just as well. It is our duty to have unity and togetherness one with another in the body. And the body and its members, by the way, are all in one place. This letter in, in Corinthians or Ephesus, it is written to one body. And so the church being the body, this body is together, okay? It's a local called out assembly. There, there is not an arm in Alaska and a hand in France and they are all working together. It's, a, it's local together in the churches that this is a body. And there's not a stack of legs over here in the church. And there's not a, a pile of heads over here in the church. We are put together by God in a proper way as the church. We all have a place in the church, whether we know what it is or not yet. And it's, it's not to just do whatever we want. It's not to do someone else's job, but to do our own particular part while operating in harmony with the entire body as a well-oiled machine. There is a verse I love that I just, the light switch flipped on years ago when I read it, and it's here in Ephesians, and it's chapter 4, verse 16 on this subject, and it says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This verse did it for me and just made me to see every joint supplieth how, how there's to be togetherness and we're all in a work together here. And there's diversity, there are differences for positive reasons as we are the body to be doing the work of the Lord together. I was trying to explain this to a member one time, one-on-one -on -one and uh, a new Christian, and I... Uh, I remembered that out in the car, I had this chain of paper, if you will. It was something to do with some kind of something at my kid's school. And I went and got that paper, and it was one link after another of paper. And they were stapled together. And I was talking about our responsibility and the way that every single one affects the church. And so I took that, that really nice linked together paper design of something, and I cut one of those things, and it fell. And I believe the light went on there. 
for an understanding of how every member is important. Everything they do in the, in the church, everything they do in their lives, everything about a church member affects the rest of the church. Being part of the body has responsibility. And it's not only about action. It's not only about work. It's about attitude as well. It's not just about working well. It's about working well together as the church. You know, there may be some that can do a good work in and of themselves, but it, it may not be contributing overall if it's not all to, in togetherness and unity with the rest of the church. There can even be a negative motivation come from work that is done in the church. And that's opposite of the harmony that we're called to in the work that we're to do. So let us examine the motive in the work as it matters greatly. But as we think about the church and as we think about this special group that we are, there is something very special by way of the empowering of the church. You know, the conviction to be in harmony with one another. If you would have seen me on the job before I became a Christian, I mean, it, was, it wasn't pretty sometimes. And, and I didn't even mind what I did. I was going to, to speak my mind, whether it caused something negative or, or whatever. But it's, it's just not that way, or it shouldn't be that way in the family of God. We have conviction about the harmony that there is to be among this body. It makes us work out our differences more maturely. We consider the health of the church more important than our own feelings on, on how to act on something or what to do about something. We, we're, we just can't drive a wedge uh, deliberately without having conviction of what it could do to the church. The church is a body, all connected together, many members with diversity, but functioning connected all for the same purpose. The church is not just a diverse body, though. The church is a divine body. You notice what we read in Ephesians one twenty three there, which is... His body. This is the Lord's church. We are His body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ. The church is a divine body. It belongs to the Lord God. The church is is a developing body. We grow and we develop as a living body, one with another. It's a different body. No other body of people, no institution is empowered by the Holy Spirit like the church is. In Ephesians 1 here, we see the church is a body. As we go to Ephesians 2... We see the church is a building. Ephesians 2.19 Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building... Fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Well, we have in the past, in some lessons, just dismantled the idea of the church being a building. And here we have Paul saying that the church is a building. But let's understand... We're talking about figurative words, not literal, but something figurative to explain this and to get the point across. 
And here we have described to us the church's relationship to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in the church. Paul says some things to make us see here how the church is likened unto a building. Right here in these verses we just read, first of all, it says in verse 20 that the church was built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And and that simply means that the apostles Apostles and the prophets were the first members of the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. You can go reference that from a past verse that we used. But, but liken it to a building. The church was built upon a foundation. But also in verse 20, we see that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of the church. Now, now that is used in building. The, the thought of that is used in building something. You take the chief cornerstone of something, and from that you build out from it. You know, there are a lot of religions, by the way, and they're trying to build something without the chief cornerstone. It's as if they're tripping over that stone all the time to go build something without the main piece that they need. And Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. After the cornerstone is first in place, then the entire structure is built around it. All of the stability of what is being built comes from the chief cornerstone. And then we see in verse 21 the phrase, and holy temple. And holy temple would take us back to a reference from the Old Testament, but the church is holy and it's set apart for God like an holy temple. You know, the church is not to be about the things of this world. The church is holy and it's set apart, and, and there are many who are making the world feel comfortable. Things are becoming like the world in the church, but the church is to be set apart. The church is God's here on earth for the purpose of glorifying Him. And then in verse 22, it says, "...ye also are builded together." You know, the church is not built out of wood or stone. The church is built out of believers. You know, builders are particular about the materials they use. Some like to use wood. Others like to use hardy plank. I believe they got stucco down for every climate now, but in the past they wouldn't build a stucco home in certain climates because they didn't like how it reacted to the weather. Builders are particular about what they use. God is particular about the church and what it's made out of. It is made out of baptized believers. And then in verse 22, it says, For an habitation of God through the Spirit. You know, the Lord has been with His church individually this past week in what we've been doing, where, where we've been. The Lord's going to be with His church individually throughout this next week when we leave here tonight. But the Lord dwells with His church in a very special way. When the church is together, the church is likened unto a body. The church is likened unto a building figuratively. The church is likened unto a bride. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. I'm going to refer back to this again in a minute. And it says... For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The church is likened unto a bride. A building describes the relationship 
of the church to the Holy Spirit. The bride describes the relationship of the church to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Every child of God has a relationship with the Lord, but there is a greater, precious experience of relationship with the church. Don't take my word for it if you don't want. We can read in the Bible in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. It says, we referenced this last week too. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints and he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb and he saith unto me, these These are the true sayings of God. But we also see in Ephesians 5 and verses 25 through 27 concerning the church and this figurative terminology of the church being likened unto a bride. And it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And then we also have, back to Revelation chapter 22, and verse 17 for one more verse, it says, And the Spirit... And the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. With the church being figuratively described as a bride here, you know, it would help us to consider a marriage in that day and time, and the details of a marriage then. And, and so you consider the betrothal period. And the betrothal period was kind of like the engagement today, uh, but not, but different. When, when a, a marriage was agreed upon between two, which was primarily on the part of the parents agreeing on that, more than the couple, and that's a temptation to stop for a minute, I'm not, I'm, it's a temptation to stop for a while, I'm not, but I just would love to say this, and that is for, for godly parents that can give godly counsel, or, or preachers, or Sunday school teachers, or anyone in the lives of young people who are considering marriage, it's good to listen to those who can give good counsel. It's good not to have that tunnel vision and and just to do what you want to do about a decision for the rest of your lives, but to consider godly counsel in it. And so in this day and time, the betrothal process, it involved the parents of the couple, and there was a contract put in place, and that couple was then considered legally married, though they did not live together yet. This was, and this was spoken of in, in 2 Corinthians 11 2 here, uh, like we just read, but there's not only the betrothal uh, stage of, of the engagement part, if you will, but you can also consider the marriage as we're likening the, the church unto the bride of Christ. The church is a bride. In the marriage, after a certain age now, I, you have the betrothal, and then after a certain age, and at a certain time, the bridegroom would go to where the bride lived and escort her back to the father's house. Now, as we consider this, and we're considering 
the relationship here and the church being called a bride, we might consider some very familiar verses in John 14 where Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I consider the relationship that we have with Jesus a marriage sometimes. And thinking about that, isn't it wonderful that He is coming to get us one day and He is taking us back to the Father's house. But there's not just the marriage after the betrothal. Now there is also the marriage supper. So then the bride and groom, okay, the the marriage is complete. And the bride and groom would enter their new home in the appropriate way at the appropriate time. And then guests would gather for a marriage supper for the couple. And we see the spiritual parallel in this again in Revelation 19, 7 through 9. And I'm going to read it again so that we can get the application of this. And again, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and the wife hath made herself ready. And go down to verse 9. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Jesus is coming to the clouds, so he's coming to get us, and he's taking us through to the Father's house. And you know that we're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ, and, and those works, which I've been told by my mentors, are not going to be as many as I think I'm going to have because of the motive uh, in them, that works are good, works that we did were good, they were done for the wrong reasons or with the wrong motive, and they're going to be burned up. But the point about this is when when we have what's left, when we have those works, and they have all been tried by that fire, that those works that burn up as wood, hay, and stubble, that is going to be the last thing that interrupts and interferes between us and Jesus. And then it's after that, at that time, that we are going to sit down completely whole, no sin nature, not every everything has been resolved, and we are going to sit down to the marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus, completely made to be like Him and to be in His presence, and any trace of sin is completely gone for eternity. So the church is likened unto a bride, but also a flock. We've seen that through the Bible, and we're familiar with that, that the church is likened unto a flock. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. A flock is to be watched over, and a flock needs protection. For the church to be called a flock is for very specific reason. We need to be guided. We need provision to be made for us. And we need protection. We need to be protected. We learn from this one figurative word that is used for the church that we must, as the flock of God, be completely dependent upon Jesus Christ, who, by the way, is the great shepherd. We are likened unto sheep. And if sheep did one thing, they were going to follow their shepherd. I think I mentioned this a few months ago, uh, hearing about 
two shepherds passing each with their flocks. And they stop and they talk for a minute. And the sheep are all over the place. And one shepherd will say one word and take off one way. And the other shepherd will go the other way. And the flocks will not get confused. There will not be one of another flock go with this one. They will completely, perfectly separate and follow the shepherd. We are the flock. And it takes not self-confidence. It doesn't take us needing nothing from anyone else. We need to be completely dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ, our great shepherd of the flock. Sheep place extreme dependence upon their shepherd, and so should we as the sheep of God. You know, there are constant threats. And there are constant temptations for the flock of God. You know, Satan roams the aisles of the church. And he's looking to do with God's people today what he was looking to do back in Job's day. And, and by the way, it just may be that God's using some more Job's today. That the suffering someone is going through is not for sin, but quite the opposite, for, for righteousness' sake. But he's roaming the aisles, and he's looking to have his way with any and all of those who are of the church. He will be glad to take the one who will look away and drift off into sin, he'll be glad to take them out of the church. Kind of like Demas. You know, Paul talked about Demas as a fellow laborer, this guy that's in the Bible three times. And then when Paul does some closing addresses in, a, in another book of the Bible, he, he doesn't put these accolades of fellow laborer with Demas. It's just his name, Demas. And then after that, we read where Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present evil world. It was a slow fade, and then Demas was gone. And that's exactly what Satan is roaming the aisles of the church in the midst of the flock looking for. Those who are not depending on the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are playing church, and he is more than happy to take them out and end to sin. He is a deceiver and he's very crafty and he would be glad to slip false doctrine into the church. He's always looking to be instrumental in the church being crushed by their problems and their troubles. He delights in trying to divide us and even having us to justify the division that we may be even causing. He loves to manipulate a situation. We're called as the flock to have complete dependence on Jesus Christ, that there not be damage to the rest of the flock. We're, we're all responsible. We're all, every joint supplieth. We all affect one another. We desperately need to look to Jesus Christ in all things as the church. But the church is not only considered like a flock, but the church is called a candlestick in the Bible as well. And we read of that in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. The words of Jesus are, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the church is likened unto a candlestick here with another figurative word. You know, Jesus says, ye are the light of the world. The church likened unto a candlestick speaks of and conveys the church's relationship to the world. Jesus in John 9, 5 says of himself, I am the light of the world. He has saved you and I out of the darkness of sin, and he has made us to be light to the rest of a dark world. We have a responsibility as the church to the world. In very familiar verses to you, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, 
Jesus says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do my men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is... In heaven. I've heard many of the saints pray when they're called on to pray in the church. I've heard the prayer many times Lord, may we be the lighthouse to those in darkness out in this community that they might be saved. That is our exact purpose, and that is exactly what we are to be doing. That the church would shine brightly, that it would say, hey, there's deliverance here. You can come to the shore over here, kind of like the lighthouse that would lead those to show them where the shore is. And for those drowning without a life preserver, if you will, in this world with no Savior, with no cleansing from their sins, we're to be the lighthouse. We're a candlestick and we're to... Shine light, if you will, for leading in the direction those dying in their sins that they might be saved. And then there's one more tonight that we don't hear a lot of, but it's another figurative word that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, and it's husbandry. Ye are God's husbandry. Now that we've considered the relationship of the church to the Holy Spirit and the relationship of the church to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, we can consider the relationship of the church to God the Father by this word husbandry. I have some experience with the idea of this word lately. Actually, for the last 10 years, I haven't been able to get grass to grow in my backyard for the last 10 years. I have planted grass twice. Of course, I watered it. I've pruned my trees so more sunlight can get into the grass. I've even barricaded it when it was new so the dogs wouldn't trample the wheat grass until it got established. And it does good for a while, and it goes away. And someone recently came to my house, and he looked at my ground... And he said, that poor ground needs to breathe. I'll tell you what your problem is. You need to cultivate that ground. It's suffocating. You need to cultivate it. You need to till that up so that it can breathe. And then you're going to be able to lay grass on there and it's going to grow. Sounds good. I'm all for it. I hope it works. But that word husbandry, it actually means to cultivate. It speaks of tillage. And the church is to bear fruit for the Lord. To bear fruit for God as a garden does. Or as a vineyard does. You know, Paul prayed for the church at Colossae. And he didn't just pray for them about their work but he prayed that they would be fruitful in every good work. He is the vine, and we are the branches by design so that we can bear fruit. And it takes preparation, and it takes care for that to happen, to be fruitful in the work. As we've considered how we are in togetherness and unity and we're likened unto a body and all of these things. There there is care and there is preparation that goes into a church truly being fruitful. If we are guilty of neglect, the church could become fruitless. It could become of, of no good, good for nothing. So let us see the precious nature of the Lord's church tonight. You know, the the world ought to have a hard time belittling the church to you and I. Jesus loved the church and He gave Himself for the church. And that's a lesson later on. 
But we consider tonight these words, these figurative words that give us such personal meaning on the Lord's precious church, the nature of the church, how we are a body in togetherness, how we are the material for the building. We are believers, baptized believers, born again in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the bride. Of Jesus Christ. We are the dependent flock who looks to Jesus in all things. We are the directing candlestick for the lost in darkness. And we are the fruit bearing husbandry when we are operating and being as we should, as God has designed, as He has empowered for us as a church. What a precious institution! to be part of. Uh, What a privilege that we have to have responsibility in the Lord's church. And we have His Word to guide us, to learn of the preciousness of it, and, and to take it serious with what Jesus has established and left here on this church for us. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day that that I get to go to heaven, that we get to go to heaven as the children of God. But I tell you what, it's a, it's a wonderful time of, of being together as the church. You know, what we're doing is what we're going to be doing all that much more in heaven. You know, are there some Lone Ranger Christians out there who have truly been saved but not a part of the church? You know, that's another talk for another day. But if so they're not going to know what to do in heaven. We're, we're learning right now. We're, we're worshiping the Lord. We're praising Him in song. We're learning His Word and sharing His Word. And, and so praise the Lord for His church. And I, I can't wait to continue with, with many more of these lessons. I'm glad we're only a third of the way through it myself. We're not going to have an invitation tonight. Your invitation is now from the time we leave. And if you're not a member of the Lord's church, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life to forgive you for all of your sins, you can make that personal tonight before you leave. And I would love to help you and take God's Word to be able to do it. I can't save you, but but there's a saving message in this book. And anyone here can know it tonight. So God bless you all. It's good to be back in God's house tonight. What a wonderful message this morning. And and for the Lord to add to the church this morning. What a blessing. And Lord willing, those those baptismal waters are going to be stirred next week. And and we're going to baptize Charlotte. And so with that, I pray you all have a great week. Remember to pray at noon together for the church. Brother Rick Morris, would you close us in a word of prayer tonight, sir?